Welcome back, everybody. Another week of Talking Penguins here on the Post Gazette Sports YouTube channel. Andrew Destin with Matt Menzel. And Matt, we got a lot to talk about here. Um, coming to you guys after Wednesday's Wednesday afternoon, excuse me, uh, press conference from Kyle Dubas, president of hockey operations for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, people coming into this, maybe we're expecting a lot of answers about the Penguins' direction of the season. And Kyle preached patience. Um, I know we have a lot to get into, but. Um, off the bat, um, no exciting moves, no Jim Rutherfordness of making a big move off the bat, telling reporters in the room, nothing like that, huh? No, I mean, I don't know. What's he supposed to say in terms of the patience? Nah, this team sucks. We're going <laughs> to blow it up and just these guys should stop trying to play. Um, that part's not surprising. Um, you know, he's also going to wait for the market to materialize. I mean, the closer we get to the deadline, typically teams get more active. You mentioned Jim Rutherford. That's the exception. Jim's one executive who likes to get guys in early so they can develop chemistry and get going. But, um, you know, there's a reason that we see a lot of these deals happen within 48 hours of the trade deadline. Um, it's GM's just kind of waiting for, you know, really for, for buyers to become desperate. So, um, you know, it makes sense that um, Kyle Dubas would want to just kind of let things breathe and um, see how things play out over the couple weeks, next couple weeks. But I, I do think he said a few things about where this team is heading. Um, didn't give a ton of information, but I think he provided at least the, you know, kind of the framework of, of what we can expect from the Penguins over the next, you know, six months, maybe. Yeah. And one thing I want to jump into quickly here, but before we get into that, I want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. Again, that's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Um, Matt, one thing you wrote about, and I know there were a lot of things that you encompassed in your story off of Dubas's press conference, but um, a talking point from Dubas was for the Penguins uh, needing to get younger. Um, don't know if this was a particularly surprising point, but it was one that he brought up to, and I'm sure that there's lots of us, lots for us to get into there. Yeah, uh, I mean it's interesting because I mean he contributed to the team getting older with his moves last offseason. But yeah, I mean everybody could see it. Um, it's not just the average age of the roster. I mean the Penguins are the NHL's oldest team. Um, many of their top players are in their mid 30s. We all see that. But um, you know it's not just they don't have young players. It's you know all the teams that compete for the cup they have at least one or two young studs who are helping to drive the bus. So it's not a matter of just like, let's get Sam Pullen up here to, to play on the fourth line. It, it's a matter of finding young impact players um, who push teams deep into the playoffs. I mean, that's just what we've seen, you know, Colorado, Cal McCarr, um, you know, um, what Braden Point from Tampa, for example. So, yeah, so it, I thought that part was interesting, not that he – said, okay, yeah, we need to get younger. We can all see that. But he said that while answering a question about Jake Gensel. Um, you know, he talked about Jake's contributions to the team, you know, both in the past and this season. But then he pivoted to say, look, we got to get younger. We have a lot of guys in their 30s. And essentially said, without saying it, that, you know, by default, Jake could end up being the odd man out. Because the best way to get younger right now and to get some real impact players or one real impact player – um, you know, under the age of 25 in the door here um, is trading Jake Gensel at the trade deadline. Yeah. And it seems like that's something that, you know, he's making no reservations one way or the other, what direction he's going to go. But as you said, that's a really quick way to do it. Um, and it maybe isn't a surprise either, but when he's highlighting the core of the older guys, the hall of fame, future hall of famers that he's mentioning of the Crosby, Malkin, Latang, um, it wasn't Gensel being part of that core. It was Eric Carlson. And I don't think that that's a big shock given what, Kyle Dubas gave up this offseason, but it almost came across to me as, you know, we're building around these four. Gensel is not part of that group. There's only so many guys that we can keep. And if you're choosing between one guy, Carlson is the more logical choice for myriad reasons, whether it be it contract status, um, fit on the team, replaceability. Maybe that's me spitballing and speculating too much, but that's at least what it kind of came across to me is that Carlson is who they're going to ride with versus trying to extend Jake in the short term or immediate future right before the trade deadline. I have three words for you. No movement clause. Yep. That's the one you left out. I mean, there's yeah. a reason that he, I mean, there's, there's a few reasons why, you know, the Penguins are going to commit to these four players. Um, but a big one is all four of those guys have full no movement clauses. Yeah. 
So it's there's certainly that's a, a big factor there. And on the note of no movement clauses, a number of guys elsewhere on the roster. I mean, I forget exactly the number in total here. 11 or 12, I believe. 13 it. have some form or fashion of no movement clauses. Yeah, so there you have it. 13 guys, and uh, Kyle Dubas said he has not approached any of those guys about considering moving them um, ahead of the yet. trade. Yeah, yet. Yet. So I, you tip the hand there. Do you anticipate those being conversations that maybe take place over the next two and a half weeks? Yeah, not with the core four guys that we just talked about, which apparently includes Eric Carlson. I, I, you know, Kyle said he made it clear to them that, um, you know, and Mike Sullivan apparently that, you know, th those guys are safe through the season and they want to build around them. Um, but yeah, maybe some of these other guys, um, you know, especially guys with with partials. I mean, Jake has um, partial no movement or no trade clause. I don't have the data in front of me in terms of how many teams that is, but. Um, you know, if there's a team that's on his list that is in contention for a cup that Jake might be interested in or think he might want to sign there, like, yeah, you might approach Jake and say, well, what about this? Or a guy like Raquel. Um, Raquel has partial no trade protection. Um, you know, if the right team comes along that's on his list, maybe he goes to Raquel and says, what do you think about this? I mean, this is like commonplace. This happens. Um, you do see sometimes players like wielding that power. Um, you know, Phil Kessel nixed a trade to Minnesota a few years back before he ultimately got dealt to Arizona. We all remember the Patrick Hornquist saga. He had a full no trade, I believe. And, um, you know, then Jim Rutherford tried to trade him. And he was like, you know what? If you don't want me, I'll leave. I'll go to Florida, finish his career there. So, um, you know, they're not completely like just making these players off limits, but it does kind of trim down the potential suitors for the Penguins if they do move some of these guys. Um, you know, it's more so we're talking about guys like Raquel, um, Jake Gensel, obviously, Riley Smith. Um, but in terms of guys with no movement clauses, um, yeah, I don't expect that to happen. And, and also don't get excited about Jeff Carter, people. <laughs> <laughs> even if even if Jeff Carter did want to be moved, I, I, you know, I don't think there's going to be too many people lining up to trade from. No offense to Jeff. I think we kind of need to clip that highlight. That's breaking news if there ever was one. Well, it's not. Well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a worthwhile point to bring up, though, about all these contracts, because uh, Duba said how he's been approached by numbers of other general managers about players on his roster. And it kind of brings up the point of who is realistic that can be moved. If you have all these no move, no trades, you have a core four of guys that, you know, it, included in that group that you don't want to move. It raises the question of how many guys really are realistic that could be moved relatively easily. And, you know, that's excluding the group of the no move, no trades. And I know you've highlighted a few of those. We've talked about them on this podcast before, but um, is that a list that's bigger than maybe just a name or two, or is it a bigger list than maybe I'm leading on to? I mean, it's a bigger list. Um, I mean, we should probably talk more about Jake Ensel here in a second. Sure. Um, but yeah, Jake's atop the list. Kyle said as much that, um, you know, he's he said that Jake is at the forefront of everything the team does at the trade deadline. We'll see if that means he sticks around. Um, I mentioned Riley Smith. He has one year left on his deal, but obviously that signing has been not great. Um, it doesn't look like Riley wants to be here. And as much as he's struggled this year, I still think, you know, he has enough of a, a track record um, that a contender like Florida or maybe goes back to Vegas, maybe one of those teams comes out to him. I think he has um, a $5 million cap hit. He definitely has one year left on his deal beyond this year. So maybe the Penguins just try to trade him for what they can and, and create a little bit more financial flexibility and maybe pick up a future asset. Um, Alex Nedeljkovic is one we talked about previously. Um, he's kind of come back down to earth here a little bit. Um, I won't say what he did to his bed in the last game. Um, in his words, he soiled the bed. Um, but he has struggled. Uh, so I don't know if he's going to have the same kind of value um, that maybe he would have you know, a month ago or six weeks ago, but he's a pending UFA. Um, you know, there's another one in there I'm forgetting about. Um, but you also think about some guys with term. Um, Ricard Raquel, you know, I don't know what his value is right now on the market. I, I'd assume he still has potential trade value, but, you know, he has three more years left on that contract. He's a guy who's, you know, in his 30s, early 30s, and has had – a disappointing season. I don't know if teams are going to be, you know, really trying to get him, but you know, maybe that's one thing they could do is to move on from him and create the flexibility. Um, you know, Brian Russ has a full new, uh, full no move clause or no trade clause. He's not going anywhere. And then the one guy I do worry about, or not worry about, not worry. I'm not worried. I don't care. Um, bad word. 
uh, I wonder about is what I meant to say is Marcus Pedersen. I'm not saying they should trade Marcus. I think he's had a great year, although he's he too has stumbled a little bit here the last couple of weeks. But um, very good player. Um, you could ar argue he's been their second, maybe you know at minimum third best defenseman this year. Um, but he only has one year left on his contract beyond this year. And um, you know Kyle Dubas is talking about Chris Letang and Eric Carlson. Um, you know being here for the long haul, or at least for the next couple of years, um, you know, are they going to be able to afford Marcus Pedersen, especially with them giving out that contract to Ryan Graves? So, you know, I'm not saying they should trade Marcus. Uh, I'm just saying that's one to watch here because, um, you know, as much as Jake Ensel um, is obviously maybe the, the biggest name that potentially could trade change teams across the league, um, I do think Marcus Pedersen is a player that if they did put him out there, um, he would be able to get them a pretty nice return as well. Yeah. And it's not as if this isn't a guy they've floated before in the past. You know, we've talked about it. Yeah. Marcus has almost been traded like 28 <laughs> times since he came to Pittsburgh. I mean, he, you know, he would have been in the JT Miller deal last year if that would all come together, for example. Yeah. Poor so, guy. I, yeah. It feel for him. It, what, a, what a kind fellow too. I mean, nothing but just lovely. But, I mean, he seems at this point in his career that he doesn't, you know, maybe uh, understandably, young guy early in your career you get traded and then you're talking about getting traded again i, I can easily see that letting um that affect your play i mean we've kind of seen that with po joseph a little bit but you know i think at this stage in his life and his career as much as probably marcus doesn't want to be moved um you know i think he's able to block out that kind of chatter yeah probably better than earlier on in the career but you mentioned gensel obviously need to get more on that um, you know, it was not made abundantly clear uh, by Dubas, nor was he particularly asked about it if he's had direct conversations or discussions with Gensel's camp agent Ben Hankinson as of late um, when it comes to contract negotiations for an extension. Um, you said it, Dubas has not made any concrete decisions about Gensel's future, um, but these next two and a half weeks are going to be a big factor there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of directions the Penguins could go here with Gensel. I'm just opening up the floor to this conversation, what actually tangibly could happen over the two and a half weeks that would make it seem, at, you know, logical is not the word that I want to use, but um, feasible that the Penguins maybe would keep Gensel. And conversely, how do you expect this playing out? Yeah, I don't believe that what the team does on the ice over the next two and a half weeks will dictate anything. I, I think maybe that was more of a reference. I could be wrong, but more of a reference to contract talks if they're even ongoing. Um yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. I would say I went into this press conference kind of still leaning towards the fact that they might keep Jake. Um, you know, obviously, I felt more strongly about it two weeks ago before he got hurt, before the team lost five or six. You know, they could make the case like, OK, well, we're within striking distance of a playoff spot. Um, we're just going to see this through. But the, the last couple of weeks, at least, I think it, it's kind of changed a lot of things. Um, you know, so we'll see. What what I what I do think is I don't think there's any way um, that they just let Jake um, play out the year and potentially test free agency. I think if there's a deal, if there isn't a deal in place over the next two weeks, um, they will move him. I don't think they really have a choice to move him. I mean, I, I think if they were still within striking distance of the playoff spot, still right there. I mean, I think you could justify it as. Yeah, let's give this team a shot to see what he can do. But I, I think the team has, has made a loud statement the last couple of weeks that this team ain't doing anything. So, you know, I, I think it would be prudent of Kyle if he's not able to get something done um, to move on from Jake. And, you know, I found his comments interesting. I mean, just circle back to what we were talking about 10 minutes ago or whatever. I mean, the fact that he was like, Jake's a great player, um, but I've told him this. Um, you know, we need to get younger. And so that to me tells you what Kyle is thinking. And um, so, We'll see. Um, I do think Jake wants to stay here. Um, you know, I, I, I do think Jake is a player who doesn't care too much about, um, you know, I make X amount of dollars and it stacks up with this player. Um, but he also wants to feel wanted and money often makes a player feel wanted or, or coveted. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. But, um, you know, I will say I, I walked away from that conf press conference with Kyle with you know, now leaning towards Jake is going to be gone. Yeah, it's kind of the same conclusion I came to just based off his comments. And you know, the one thing that stuck with me in particular was when talking about Jake, then he also brought up the need, as we've mentioned, to get younger and brought up a few of the key prospects in the Penguin system, but also highlighting the importance of taking advantage of another team's surplus at a certain position of 
young guys. If let's say, for example, they have seven or eight young defensemen they think highly of in an organization, or you know, you know, a surplus of forwards that they like, it'd be hard for the Penguins to not take advantage of that, just given where their prospect pool is at as an organization. And it's not as if when he talks about getting younger, I don't think the solution, and you know, I'm saying the obvious part out loud here, but the solution is not coming internally, right? It's going to have to be external upgrades. Right. And I do think like if he trades Jake, like I don't know how much like a, a you know, a 2025 first round picks means to the Penguins. You know, I think the package is going to be headlined if they move him by a really good young prospect who's knocking on the door of the NHL if he isn't there already. I mean, I think the Penguins should prefer that um, over a first round pick because, you know, odds are if a team is trading a first round pick to get Jake Gensel, that team is good and it's not going to be a high pick, and you just don't see many players outside of the top five um, you know, make the leap to the NHL right away, and then there's even fewer who su- succeed. I know um, in Pittsburgh, we've seen a lot of guys come right in. We just you know, saw one of them get their jersey retired here um, the other day, guys who came right in as rookies and made an impact, but that's rare. So you know, I, I, I do think if the Pens look to move Jake Ensel, they're going to be looking for good young players. And the thing I keep going back to is the package that uh, Winnipeg got for Dubois from the Kings. A um, little bit different because that was an offseason move and they had a contract lined up with Dubois, who was going to be a free agent. Um, but they got Gabe Villari, a, a good young center. Um, they got Alex Iafalo, who is a veteran winger. And they got some other stuff too. So it wasn't just like future picks and all that stuff. They got some some young contributors who could walk in. I think that's the kind of the package that the Pens could look for if they were to trade Jake Denzel. Right. It's certainly, I mean, there's different ways you could go about it, but I feel like if you are the Penguins, that's the more preferable option, like you mentioned with all those reasons outlined. Um, one more one more thing, not to cut you off, but, um, sure. you know, when Kyle's talking about the next couple of weeks as well, I mean, I also don't completely rule out the possibility – we were talking about dumping a guy with term, um, you know, maybe one of the factors of play is like, okay, maybe, maybe the return for Jake isn't quite a home run. Um, so maybe there's a way the pens move, say Raquel. And then suddenly that gives them the financial flexibility to bring Jake. So I'm not saying that's what I think is going to happen, but I, I do think that's just like one other potential Avenue that this could go with Jake. Yeah. It's just an example of how this isn't so cut and dry black and white as it might seem from the outside is that, there's a lot of factors at play here. And Dubis mentioned one other thing being that they are opening up a little bit of cap space this off season too. It's not extensive. It's not going to be quite to the degree of last year before they got Eric Carlson, but they will have a little bit more wiggle room to work with with guys like Jeff Carter coming off the books. Um, not to the degree that you would be able to maybe upgrade the roster as much, but like you said, I mean, you could move a guy like Raquel theoretically and make that kind of contract a little bit more digestible, but certainly not easy. Um, on the flip side, I uh, wanted to bring this up quickly before we get into some other topics. Um, Dubas mentioned not being willing to trade any future assets to make the team better ahead of this year's trade deadline. Um, that probably isn't much of a surprise, but just given where this team's at uh, in terms of the draft picks it does have at its disposal, it feels like that's not really much of an option um, regardless, right? These aren't things that are going to be moved in conjunction probably with any move, even extending into the offseason. I don't know that draft picks are something that the Penguins are going to be willing to part with in any case. Yeah. They're not going to be buyers. Yeah. Plain and Makes simple. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're not going to trade a second for Michael Granlin and then have to trade a second to dump him three weeks later. Yeah. I mean, it's rel- it's like significant that he said it, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of the team has said enough. Um, anything they do over the next two weeks um, shouldn't change their mind on that that this team deserves um, further investment. Yeah. You should look ahead to next year or, um, you know, do nothing, but, but don't add. Yeah. But looking at the next year, one last thing, just before getting into some final thoughts here is um, ex- uh, express the commitment to Mike Sullivan once more. That's something that was echoed in December. Um, that was probably the least surprising news I think that we got yesterday. Um, but just based off of hearing that the contract that Sullivan signed recently, that extends him out quite a bit further um this is maybe a vote of confidence that i was expecting but it kind of i don't know i, I guess it just was something to bring up quickly of hey this is something that kyle reaffirmed that hey do uh that sullivan is still somebody we want to work with moving forward i mean i i don't know i i didn't feel the same way really? um 
Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like surprised that he's going to coach out the rest of the season, but um, I don't know. I mean, he very much is under scrutiny, and rightfully so. I mean, this team, uh, even just for the fact that they need a different voice, but um, you know, this team's power play has completely torpedoed the season, and I know that's like Todd Reardon's thing, but Mike Sullivan is oversees it. He's in charge of everything. Um, the team is like giving away so many points in overtime. Um, they blew, you know, they lost four games when they led after two periods. I mean, they're seven and 16 and one goal games. Um, you know, so I'm not saying like, I think that Mike Sullivan should be fired, but, um, you know, I also didn't expect Kyle to come out and double down and say, um, you know, okay, like Mike's our guy. And it wasn't even just that he said, you know, Mike's our guy for the rest of the year. Um, he also implied that they think Mike's going to be the guy going forward. I mean, it did kind of leave it open. He said, we'll talk with Mike after the season and we'll be thorough um, and get his view on everything. But he talked about Mike being a guy who can develop young players down the road. Um, that to me speaks, you know, not even just a commit, uh, you know, a vote of confidence for the rest of the year, but you know, it makes it seem like Mike is going to come back beyond this year. So um, I don't know. I was surprised. You see, you see coaches change so much in the NHL. Um, you know, I had the stat recently that, you know, Mike Sullivan recently coached in his 800th game. Um, 14 months earlier, he coached in the 700th game. And between those, you know, two milestones, 13 teams changed coaches. So um, you just see a lot of change in the NHL. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just a little bit surprised that Kyle went out of his way to say, um, you know, Mike's our guy. But maybe it kind of circles back to what um, we were talking about at the top, about patience. Like, you know, what's he supposed to say? What kind of message does he send to the team if he's like, eh? We'll see. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, Mike's future was very much an open question. Yeah, I think it's certainly one, like you said, more so after the season. I guess I was more coming from the angle of nothing to worry about in the interim because it's not something like the situation that happened with the Kings earlier this year where you're a playoff team that you fear you start fading and you fire Todd McClellan. It's a little bit different situation than that where you're going to kind of play the strings out of the season and then maybe reevaluate after that. But Maybe more the angle is, you know, and it's not to say that Fenway Sports Group is short for money. That's far from the case. But just given the financial commitment to Sullivan and what they did, you know, prior to the start of last season, I believe that was. I'm extending him. I might have that wrong. Um, but that's just something that came to mind for me. But not that that's particularly relevant when performance is fading and for all the aforementioned reasons that you brought up. So um, it's yeah, I just don't think firing him changes anything. That's, that's yeah. really what it comes down to, at least like for the rest of the season. Yeah, certainly not. Um, one thing I wanted to get into, um, unless we have anything else trade deadline related, related to Kyle Dubas um, that we didn't touch on, wanted to get into the Yager discussion because didn't get a chance to talk about that. We didn't do a Sunday podcast, um, of course, because of that night and just based on and wanting to look ahead to Dubas's press conference. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that night, um, being there. Both of us were there. Obviously, you were somebody who grew up being in the presence of watching Yager or at least um, being more familiar with his play than I was. Just wanted to ask you, what do you make of the night and the event in general? Yeah. I mean, the Penguins knocked it out of the park. Um, they do with all these ceremonies. Uh, I mean, this one was special because we haven't seen a, a Jersey retired in a couple of decades now, but um, it was great. I, it's significant, obviously that Mario Lemieux was there um, given the differences he's had with Fenway sports group. We'll see if that, you know, kind of leads to a thawing in that relationship. Um, you know, they were able to thaw the relationship with Yarmer Yager, although it sounds like a lot of that was on, on Yarmer's end. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was a great ceremony. I think some of the things that stand out, obviously, um, him coming to practice on Saturday, um, you know, I think that was really cool for the players. I thought it was really cool for the fans. And I think he got a kick out of it too. Um, you know, Sunday, I don't know, maybe it was a little overkill with the warmups. Um, Obviously cool for the fans. Uh, I love seeing Sid and some of the players wear the mullet wigs, but, um, you know, it was already a disruptive kind of ceremony, um, you know, for the players and then for them to have Yager out there during warmups. I don't know. Um, so you do wonder about that. I mean, the Penguins couldn't have predicted, you know, two weeks ago or whatever, when they were putting everything together that, the, you know, that game would essentially become such a must win for them. But the ceremony itself was top notch. Um, his speech was amazing. Um, you know, I loved him just kind of chirping his former teammates. And then obviously the line about his girlfriend being there that um, she was too young to remember him playing for the Penguins, but he told her all about it. So, you know, I think Yager's, you know, his gratitude and his personality and his sense of humor 
um, shown through. I, I know you were touched by, um, you know, just uh, the the moment he shared with his mom who was there. So, yeah, I, I think the ceremony hit all the right notes. And, you know, Yager is still here. He's been hanging around. He was at the last game. I think he just – he might be homeless. I think he lives inside the arena. Um, you know, anytime they showed him on TV, he was just, like, crushing food. So I, I don't know what's going on there. No, I'm kidding. But, um, yeah, it, it was it was a great weekend, um, you know, for the nostalgia factor. And I also think it's cool um, – not even just for Yager, but um, there's a lot of younger fans. Maybe they're watching this on YouTube um, who don't remember watching Lemieux and Yager play back in the day. So I think it was cool that those 91 and 92 teams, like players from those teams, like Ron Francis, Brian Trottier, that they were in the spotlight as well. So I, ju I just think it was a great weekend all around um, for the Pittsburgh Penguins and for Yarmar Yager. Yeah, couldn't have put an A there myself. Touched on all the notes, and the only regret was not being there for Saturday's practice to see that. That must have been a true treat, but I'm glad I caught up with the videos online. That was at least fun to see from you with the, the video work. It's cool to see Yager taking part in practice, but all told, yeah, I mean, well done ceremony. Can't I can't really add much to that, so um, just want to say that that was excellent, and I was glad to be a part of it. Glad we got to cover that, and uh Want to bring it up to stick taps just to close out this podcast um, after a lot of heavy discussion there about Dubas. Um, Pucks in uh, your end. What do you got, Matt? You got a stick tap this week? No, nobody's getting a stick tap. <laughs> Somebody's got to do something. Sid again. Sid is the best player on the team and carries them every game. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have any stick taps for anyone else. This team has lost five of six, 12 of 18. Um, they're free falling. What are they now? 10 points out of a playoff spot. Um, I, so Sid, I'll give my stick tap to Sid for being the one guy who has really uh, consistently brought it game in and game out. I feel like that's this season in a nutshell, man. I'm not saying anything groundbreaking. It's just like we, either you or I have said Sid for stick taps like every other week this this year. There's I mean, really you could. Well, I, I was saying like, you know, I was talking to someone earlier today, like who on this team is overachieved? No one. Maybe Marcus Patterson. I mean, I would argue Sid is slightly overachieved. I mean, I know you expect it from him, but who in this team has like played above their head this year or done well beyond what you expected? Um, you know, maybe Ned for a little while, but he's come back down to earth. So yeah, no one has really stepped up. Um, and the reason the Penguins are, are still, you know, can kind of squint and see a playoff spot um, is Sid's brilliance. Yeah. I got nothing to add. That's perfect. All right. Let's go. You got to add something. It can't just be me talking. All right. All right. Fine. Fine. Uh, my stick tap is going to go to Lars Eller. I was just going to say for him, if, Nobody has performed above expectations like Crosby has at the very least. But if there's anybody who has played to expectation, um, I think Lars has exactly done that. And if anything, maybe slightly more, but that's just given the offensive contributions because uh, now it's 11 seasons he's had with 10 plus goals. I don't know if that was something that was particularly expected. And Kyle Dubas mentioned uh, during his press conference yesterday how the third and fourth lines have kind of been asked to produce more offense because of how bad the power play has been maybe at the sacrifice of more defense. Um, I don't think that's been the case with Lars, though. I think it's still been pretty consistent defense. The metrics will show that. Um, and offensively, has probably chipped in more than expected. So um, by no means a world beater. We're not saying that that's Lars Eller, but I'd say it's been a pretty good season all around for him. Well, now that you just praise Lars Eller, he's the one I was I couldn't remember earlier when I was talking about a potential trade candidate. Ooh. Um, teams are desperate for centers. I don't think you're getting a first-round pick for Lars Eller, but – a lot of teams are looking for centers. I know he has another year beyond the season, um, but the cap number is under three million. Um, yeah, so sorry, Lars, you're, you're doing great, but we we just essentially traded you. You're going to the Hartford Whalers. But yeah, he he's a player to watch as well. As good as he's been, team wants to get younger. Um, yeah, that's another name to watch here in the next uh, fifteen days. Well, he's good, so therefore he's gone. Okay, cool. We're up to speed. Sweet. All right, that's going to do it for our chat this week. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We will catch you all again next week. Be sure to keep up with all our content here on the YouTube channel as well as at post-getzet.com. And we will Nailed catch, it. You uh, Nailed it. catch you guys next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>